I'm Zach Mayfield and let's rewind to 2009. I had this haircut and your parents were still probably suffering from a global economic crisis. And although Tiger decided to leave golf for a bit, many of you in this room are my children. At least Barack found his keys to the big house and Call of Duty dropped a fire mixtape. Speaking of music, remember when Kanye did this stuff? I'm gonna let you finish, but Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. Yep, that was 2009. To shake off the Kanye cringe, at least we were blessed to see the blue boys and a pissed off dad come to the big screen. Hey Liam, can I borrow your camera? I will kill you. But perhaps the most important event in 2009 was the release of the Panasonic Lumix GH1 which was the very beginning of mirrorless video. There's even some old test videos on the Lumix YouTube channel that Philip Bloom made. Is this where you want me to talk about the camera and how it was ahead of its time in 2009? I mean, I had a few more things to cover before you come in, if that's okay. Yeah, of course, Zach. This is pre-recorded. You can edit it wherever you want to put it. Mm. But I just want to ask you, can you do that plug for my Movember fundraiser campaign? You know, the mustache? Mustache? I've been doing it 15 years and raised over 250,000 pounds now. And it's via a prize draw, loads of gear, give away you donate, and you get entered into that draw. It's a really important cause, and that's all I'm asking from you. Is that okay? Yeah, that'll work. I'd like to show you one of the world's great cameras. Okay, it's straight bonkers to me that the GH1 was the very first mirrorless camera ever, and it might even be double bonk that if you wanted one of these bad girls in 09, you're gonna need 1,500 greenbacks. Luckily nowadays, you only need about 100 to 150. Most of the time when we talk about the small camera revolution, as me and my friends say, there's a couple of cameras that come to mind. The Canon 5D Mark II and the Canon 5D Mark III. But I'm here to say that I think our lovely little GH1 here deserves a lot more recognition for her place in camera history. The legacy and the unbridled passion beneath the aluminum alloy of this here camera inspire me to find out. One, does the video quality stand the test of time? Two, if so, what should this camera be used for? And three, who should buy this camera? Okay, so there are a couple of problems with the GH1 that I acquired via eBay. Problem number one is the language of the camera is not set to English. So on the eBay listing, it's actually a Panasonic Lumix DMC GH1K, which I am guessing stands for Korean. So I just have to find out how to change it to English. After a quick dive through the camera's menus, I realized the language setting was nowhere to be found. I even scoured forums and ancient YouTube tutorials to no avail. However, a swift three hour read through the GH1 manual informed me that I needed to find this icon. If I can locate the sacred icon, I can change the language. Unfortunately, this adorable little egg-headed man is nowhere to be found in my GH1. We'll come back to the English problem. And problem number two is I have no lenses for the camera. So I am gonna go to my buddy's house where he has the coveted combo. Metabone Speed Booster and the Sigma 18-35. So I made the journey to Cookville, and even though me and the GH1 spoke different languages, there was one thing we could agree on, spiritually. The only way through our obstacles was to acquire the most legendary lens combination in Micro Four Thirds history. And lucky for us, my friend Matt had exactly what we needed. With the combo acquired, there's only one problem left to solve. Okay, because I can't figure out how to change the language on the GH1's menus, I think what I'm gonna do now is just solve maybe both problems with one solution. One really popular thing people did with the early GH cameras is hack them. Basically, there's this tool called P-Tool. I think you can get up to 100 megabits per second. It basically just makes the camera have much more quality than it would have had out of the box. I ran into problem after problem with the hack on my Mac. I tried downloading third-party apps to open Windows programs on my Mac, and I even took a break to eat ice cream. I know, my work ethic is inspiring. I was about to give up. Am I crazy? What the f I don't care if it has malware. I want it. When I slipped into a sugar coma from the cream, this cream led me to a dream that just might contain the solution. Well, this is clearly not working on my M1 Mac, so looks like we're breaking out the big guns. My wife's work computer.
formatting SD card. Downloading P-Tool hack. Moment of truth. Which one do we think means yes? Let's, I'm gonna guess the top one. If this works, Philip Bloom will be in my video. I am so sorry. This is pre-recorded. Oh, no way. There he was. The egg-headed man showed up on my screen, which means that our new firmware was successfully integrated into the GH1. No way, dude. Yes. I can't tell you how good this feels. This is what we do on this channel. We find solutions. We make dreams happen. We have solved our language problem, and now we can shoot at 100 megabits per second. Thank the Lord. Ideas for life. Before we turn it over to our favorite filmmaker, Dr. Phil, I'd like to show you a couple things that I learned while testing the GH1 in the field. So let's talk about ergonomics and do a little Sony a7S III comparison. I'm actually really enjoying the ergonomics of this camera and just like how the grip feels. One function I really love about this camera is you can see we're set to aperture right now, which I'm controlling with this front dial here. All you have to do to switch to shutter is click in on this button. But using the camera is actually enjoyable. The bus, the bussin? <laughs> this camera would be bussin though. The body, although small, feels nice. The grip is like deep enough to hold comfortably. I'm having a good time using this camera and I wanna see what this image looks like compared to my a7S III. What I think is pretty neat about this comparison is on the GH1 here, we got the Sigma 18 to 35 speed booster set to as wide as possible without getting any crop from the lens. It's at f1.2, no idea what that equals for full frame. On my a7S III here, obviously we're shooting 4K, S-Log3, S-Gamut3 Cine, we got autofocus, which is nifty, and we're on the Sigma 24 to 70 at 2.8. On the GH1 here, I'm using the smooth color profile. I have the sharpness, contrast, and saturation all at negative two, as well as noise reduction. It's kind of making me miss my GH5, but at the same time, I'm not because I'm absolutely in love with my a7s3 it's a perfect camera for me so it's just a little fun test next let's dissect the micro four thirds sensor's biggest fear low light the time has come to push this sensor to its limits but it's always important to have a snack so i don't get cranky i check behind me to make sure my wife isn't hiding in the car to judge my decisions then i find the courage to order can i try one of your double steak grilled cheese burritos please 920 calories Okay, so now we're gonna do a low light test while simultaneously eating this double steak grilled cheese burrito. Right now we're at F1.1 using the speed booster and we're at ISO 100, so lowest ISO. I'm gonna give you my extensive review of this burrito at the end of this test, but right now we're at ISO 200. It's a little dark on the histogram, but exposure's okay. Now we're at ISO 400. Things are looking pretty good. We got plenty of detail in the shadows and highlights. Nothing's blown out. Okay, now we're at ISO 800. It's a little bright. Stop down my aperture a little bit. ISO 800. Wow. Now we're at ISO 1600. It looks fine on this screen, but I don't know what it's gonna look like. The highest option for ISO is 3200, but it's grayed out in the menu, so I gotta figure that out quick. Just dug through the camera's menus and couldn't find it, so highest I'm gonna go is 1600. That's all I have to offer for you. This is insanely good, dude. You have to try this. How you doing? I'll give you my honest thoughts on the GH1 in the final chapter of this video, but right now it's time to take a real look back on this camera from someone who's reviewed more cameras than Red's quality control team. Ladies and gentlemen of the Mayfam, I am so honored to welcome Philip Bloom. I think it'd be helpful to give you a little bit of context as to how I got to the GH1. Spent 17 years working in news with 
broadcast cameras ones on your shoulder with just two third inch sensors and to get a shallow depth of field from these is quite hard so when i went freelance in 2006 i started messing around with depth of field adapters the letters 35 adapters you screw them onto an ex1 x3 sony cameras or panasonic hbx 200 and it gave you a super 35 mil type image and it was really nice incredibly cumbersome but the image was lovely so in october 2008 this camera was released with nikon d90 the first dslr and video i was super excited because you know it's so small compared to the big setups that i had until i used it and the image was really mediocre then a month later vincent's reverie came out using the canon 5d mark ii and like everybody i got excited by it but the more i read about it the more i thought no this is still no good for me despite how good it looked in early 2019 panasonic uk contacted me to tell me about their first mirrorless mirrorless what's that and micro four thirds what's that i didn't know about these things they told me the specs and I went, yeah that sounds really good so they sent me one and i started shooting with it and the first real use of it that i really like was in Kauai, in hawaii and i got some lovely stuff on the beach and it did slow motion, did 60p as well. And I just thought that the 1080p image was really nice. Full manual control, 24p, 25p, 30p if you wanted that. It had great technology, it had an EVF, a tilty flippy screen. I mean, how long did it take Sony to put that into their cameras? Was that the A7S III? This was a really well-featured camera and it also had autofocus for video. I mean, it wasn't great by today's standards, but back then, as there was nothing else, Panasonic had the very best autofocus in video and that's something they should put on a plaque on their wall best video autofocused 2009 and i did their launch video for panasonic uk which i filmed in joshua tree it was one of my just usual pictures and music edits and to be honest i didn't really use it that much afterwards because i did get a mark ii later that year they did bring in proper manual control proper 24p 25p panasonic have always been ahead of the competition when it comes to their features it's just they probably would be dominating the industry if they had great autofocus that compares to the canon or the sony one because they are so feature packed their cameras and it started with the gh1 now that i'm thinking about it i still can't believe that philip bloom was in my video <laughs> Thank you, Philip. But that's not what we're talking about. At the beginning of this video, I posed three questions. One, does the video quality stand the test of time? Honestly, straight out of the box, I would say no. But with the P-Tool hack, I would say absolutely yes. The quality of the high definition footage coming out of the GH1 is honestly incredible for such a cheap camera. With a flat color profile, some legendary lenses, and a person who knows what they're doing with a camera, this thing can slay. The low light performance was surprisingly good, and as usual, I'm gonna recommend that you use lights in your scenes or quality natural light, but overall, I was very impressed with how clean the 1080p images are coming out of this camera, even when I was looking at them in DaVinci Resolve. I guess that just goes to show how important it can be to shoot with a high quality codec. Question number two, what should this camera be used for? The GH1 footage still looks good in 2022, but it's not something that I would recommend for any sort of professional use. When it comes to a paid gig, you don't wanna risk everything because of some fragile firmware. I don't know how reliable the GH1's hacked firmware is, and I would only use it with hacked firmware, so I don't think it's worth the risk. However, for the daily hobbyist who needs something solid for photo and video, this is an incredible option that will not break the bank. And finally, question number three, who should buy this camera? I was thinking you, maybe? But also, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you do, or, or if you want it. You might just be watching the film for entertainment. Straight up, the GH1 is so much cooler than I expected it to be. I thought this thing might flop in this video, to be honest. It gave me such an appreciation for folks back in 2009 doing everything they could to squeeze out the maximum amount of quality from these cameras. The GH1 showed me how lucky we are to have such powerful photo video tools in 2022. And now it's not up to the technology. It's up to our ideas and our execution. There's no more excuses. So join the Discord server, the Mayfam, to talk more about gear and whatever else you want. Subscribe on the tubes of you. And for the love of all things retro, please text me when you get home so I know you're safe, I miss you, and I just need you to check in. Thank you so much for watching this video. I love you to the moon and back, baby. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Don't forget about that Western Union payment. I haven't received it yet, and 
not PayPal, Western Union. Got that?